Today, the premiers are revolting and in rebellion. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and the List. It's one of the posts covering finance and property news. And I'm joined today by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie. How are you going? Excellent, Martin. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Things are moving, and interestingly so. They are. And it'll come as a surprise to nobody, um, especially viewers of your channel. I suspect that the, the premiers in the Australian states are revolting. They would they would just assume that is as certain as the sun is rising. But Today, they're in rebellion as well. And they're in rebellion against um, the RBA, which is what I always like to see. And so um, let's talk about that because we've got some interesting data to disclose to the public as well, I think, and just to give some context to what's happening with this um, RBA reform bill. Um, but Martin, I've got some a couple of things to start with to whet people's appetites, if I may. <laughs> So first, I, I want to make a, I want to do a plug here, a commercial plug, and it's shamelessly commercial. I'm not the beneficiary. It's for Channel Seven, all right. Channel Seven. I want people to watch a television show on Channel Seven, and it's coming up on the 14th and 21st of this month, and it's called Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, and this is the. Um, the British ITV drama, the four-part drama that aired in the first week of January over there in the UK, which I don't know, it must be, if there's a list of dramas that have actually um, affected political change, this must be right up there on the list. It has had an extraordinary impact on UK politics and hopefully it'll have a knock-on effect here in Australia, but it's very well made. It's it's a it's a it's an excellent drama to watch, um, and it relates to an extraordinary scandal. We we discussed it briefly last time um, you and I talked, but um, it, it, the scandal involves. I understand Martin, one of your old employees, <laughs> Fujitsu. Um, am I allowed to disclose you work for Fujitsu? You know, yeah, in yeah. yeah. I, used to, I used to work completely unrelated, <laughs> of course, different part of the world. And uh, and f actually, bef the the UK scandal started way before I joined Fujitsu. That's so, right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. So we don't don't hold Martin North to account, but <laughs> um, to to blame. Sorry, but yeah. however, this is it was a combination of a product, a software product by Fujitsu, and um, the corporate management of the UK Post Office, and covering up the failings of this software product where the corporate groupthink took over and they um, tried to pin the blame on these local postmasters called sub-postmasters instead of owning up to the problems. In fact, there was, an active, there was an active agenda to cover up the problems. But so much so, they actually used these, I don't know how you describe them. I, I, I don't know if you have any particular insight into these prosecution, these sort of private prosecution private powers that, yep. Yep. That, 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 that exist in the UK of, Blows my mind, but anyway, it's the UK for you. Um, they've still got a king, so do we. Anyway, uh, <laughs> enough of that. Um, and yeah, they they sent they prosecuted you know um, uh, more than seven hundred of these poor postmasters. Over four hundred served jail time, and um, it took twenty years for the truth to start coming out. Now, since the drama aired, there's actually political action on. Um, providing compensation and things like that. However, it's only half the story. It's half the justice because the system, this is how, this is how the system works. And we've seen this with the banks in Australia, right? When they're finally caught out, there's no amount of money they won't throw at it, right? If it comes, if, it, if it's a matter of life and death for the lords of the system, the, key, the, the powers that be at the banks, et cetera, they will throw any amount of money at it to shut the, to shut the scandal down. But what never happens is the is the other side of justice, which is people actually being held to account, executives going to jail, etc. We ran an article in our magazine this week by Lord Prem Sikha, who's in the House of Lords over there, um, reported on what he was saying, pointing out that the the system is is geared to go slow. That the executives who are at fault will 
by the time they get around to deciding whether they're going to prosecute them, they'll be old, they'll be forgetful, all this kind of stuff, and don't expect to see actual real justice in that regard. Um, and that's just, you know, that's that's a terrible blight in the system, but that's how it works. However, at least the compensation is flowing. Even then, that's you know, I've seen some today, there's some complaints about that. Um, but it went from uh, they, they, they went from being awarded, you know, something like fifty million dollars in compensation in 2019 to now the British government has put a billion dollars, sorry, a billion pounds on the table to share as compensation, and that's and that's finally getting into some real money, um, and all in the back of this show. Now the reason we're harping on about it is because if you're a regular viewer of of Martin's show and and you've been so for a while, you would be familiar with the fact that in 2020 and 2021 and 2022. Um, our party, the Citizens Party, but also very much assisted by um, Martin's channel. In fact, there was a, there was that one day, Martin, where Mart, you and I did a show um, on a on a Monday morning, um, first thing on a Monday morning about Christine Holgate yep. and the Australian Post Office to get people to pour in calls to get an inquiry up, and not only did that those calls work and we bombarded parliament in a day with calls and we got an inquiry up and that was that was a really good shock effect but executives at Australia Post were calling people that we knew saying um that they'd seen the show they'd been watching the show as well right so we we intervened on a very um terrible situation involving Australia's the equivalent of, of the UK postmasters which are called licensed post officers and and believe me, now that Christine Holgate's gone, they're back in despair as bad as they ever were. And they're really, really um, uh, anxious about what the future holds. They do not get listened to by the corporate management of Australia Post. And so given how big the scandal has been in the UK, the fact that Channel 7 is going to air it here, we're hoping actually becomes, you know, and it's, it starts the, the first the first two episodes are on the 14th and the second two episodes on the 21st of February. It's on Channel 7 and 7 Plus. Um, hopefully, that gets enough attention. So we're going to be promoting the hell out of this show for the next few weeks to make sure it gets as many viewers as possible so we can get some politically mileage out of it. Well, it's a very important show and it had a huge impact in the UK. Interesting, though, uh, uh, Mr. Bates, who's the, you know, the, the, the person who uh, they yep. built the story around, um, he was reported this week as being offered about one sixth of the losses that he had actually ah. incurred as the compensation payment. So even now, they're still dragging the chain. And, and he was actually um, quoted earlier in the week saying, you know, it, it is so hard to try and actually break through. So even after the TV show in the UK, there's still a lot of issues there. Uh, but the good news is it's really shining a light on the way that large corporations, of course, in the UK, the post office is actually sort of a government entity, but it's a slightly arm's length, right? Mm. So basically you had this entity that was um, living in its own little bubble, but the political classes basically just came in behind. And, and, and so it was all the little people against the powers, right? Yeah. And, yep, and what yep. this is highlighting fundamentally is that you cannot let this happen because basically the big end of town will tell lies, they'll you know tell half truths. Large um, IT pl providers were also involved, and now there's another system as well as Horizon, which is the Fujitsu one, another system has now been found also to be faulty too. And so this is this is an endemic issue inside the post office. So it's really important to understand the cultural dynamics that are going on here and the fact that the government really does not want to actually really get involved, but it's now being forced to get involved, right? Yep. Unfortunately, it's only down to, you know, the voice of ordinary people being really, really loud now because it was a reaction to the show that's created all the momentum in the UK. And it's really shocking to hear that Mr. Bates is being shortchanged. So Alan Bates, his name is shortchanged so badly in what the way you've just reported. And I can't help but think, you know, that you think, well, why, you know, when there's a billion pounds on the table, why are they um, penny pinching now? Their, their, rep their reputation couldn't be any more damaged than it already is. And and my suspicion is 
they're gonna they would they would they'll ha- they'll happily compensate everyone else to the hilt probably, but they're gonna they would try and look for a way to punish something like him because he took the lead. Yep. Right. He was he was um, if you've seen that, my kids are a little bit older, so I don't get to watch Disney movies anymore. But when I got to watch Disney movies when they were little, and there's a really great one called um, uh, A Bug's Life, where there's this one ant who stands up to the grasshoppers and shows the other ants how to do it, right? And, of course, he's the one they got to crush. And um, that is the story of history, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if the if these vindictive, sadistic people who's in the post office and in the government, whose reputations are in uh, have been shredded, are still looking for a way to punish the person who – because what was extraordinary about Mr. Bates, and you've got to watch the show, it's in the opening scene. What made him the leader is that – when you're dealing with software and it's so easy to doubt yourself, right? To err as human, to really foul up requires a computer, if you've heard that expression, right? But it's so easy to doubt yourself. It's confusing stuff. And this is 1999 as well when this started, you know? So it wasn't as software, software is much more ubiquitous now. It's It was less so then, right? He was absolutely certain from the get-go that he hadn't made any mistakes. It wasn't his problem. It was the software's problem. And he never lost that certainty. And that certainty allowed him to be the clarion call to rally these, these postmasters behind him and finally achieve results. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if they're singling him out. In which case, um, um, you never know. If we, can, if we can get some traction here on the Australian side of this, and that gets noticed in the UK, you can have this, this um, back and forth effect, right, where... We, we we get traction out of what's happening in the UK. They might get traction out of what's happening here, and you can keep the heat on to to actually go after the nature of the system itself. It's not just the, the predicates, the specifics. It's, it's the nature of the system. And I describe it as when you have corporate management motivated by profit that's, that's, that's been assigned to deliver um, an essential service using community-minded people. And there's two very different cultures there. Very different cultures, and these corporate people, and they 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 want bonuses and all that. The people that they were they they were persecuting, that's not their motivation. They're 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 the local, they're pillars of their local communities. These people, right? And that's that's true for our postmasters in Australia as well, the local licensees. Um, and the 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 two don't the, the other the, the the corporate people don't get the way these licensees think. And one of the specific issues here is, as an example, the, the specific complaint, one of the specific complaints I'm given, these licensees, they are a brain's trust of expertise in Australia Post that, that collectively represent hundreds of thousands of years of expertise, right? Individually, they've got decades and decades of expertise behind them. They're having to, they're, they're being told what to do by flying executives who come in from McDonald's, Woolworths, and the banks. Right, that it, that it, that, it, that just turn up there and say, okay, I'm I've got some kind of MBA, I'm some kind of executive, I'm going to land here and I'm going to apply my executive knowledge to this particular format, post offices, and I'm going to tell you what to do because I'm going to be here for a year or two. I want to earn a big fat bonus and then I'm going to move move on, piss off, right? And you, the postmaster who's been here for decades and want to be here for decades more, you're just going to have to weather it like you've weathered over every other manifestation of the, the executives in my position. And if if they had any sense at all, Martin, of wanting Australia Post to work properly, they'd actually eat humble pie, bring in these licensees and say, how do you think we should run this joint? You're the ones that actually do it, you know, but they don't. So anyway, watch that. Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, Channel 7, February 14th and February 21. Look that up. Make sure you watch it. Can't give it a big enough plug. Mm. Now, we'll make one other quick point because one of the fundamental issues here is they said the computer never lies, right? So fundamentally, they denied that people could go through the back end and change entries inside the, the computer system. You know, the computer system was definitive and right all the time. I want to make the point Technology is built by people. People make mistakes. Therefore, technology can make mistakes. And the whole concept of saying, oh, it can't possibly be the computer system, 
the number of times I've heard that through my um, my career. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The fact garbage is computers, in, garbage, yeah. yeah, computers make mistakes. So I'm amazed how often that excuse is still trotted out more broadly. You know, oh, the computer says, see it in the bank sometimes too. The fact is computers are not absolutely always right. Well, if you want to get really, really philosophical about it, there was a there was a famous paper written by a mathematician named Kurt Gödel. <laughs> uh, I think it's called "On the Proof of God" in the '30s, who said uh, formal deductive systems cannot be both complete and consistent. And a computer is a formal deductive system. And what he's saying is, if it's complete, it's going to be inconsistent, and if it's in if it's consistent, it's going to be incomplete. Yep. What he's that what that paper's conclusion is. Any system, like a computer, will never, ever, ever, ever be perfect by definition. And if you don't understand that and you fall for this idea that we'll have a perfect computerized world one day, um, sorry, it ain't going to happen. It's never going to happen. Um, and there will always be bugs by just by the nature of the system, not to mention the fact that companies like Microsoft employ 20-year-olds who's, I believe, their job is to take every Microsoft product that eventually does work and say, how can we put patches on this to stuff it up and force people <laughs> to upgrade to a better one, <laughs> to, to the new one, right? And then you got to adjust it all again. Anyway, we can keep going for all, for a night, for, for, for all night. All right, Absolutely. Martin, let, let's change gears. Let's change gears because yeah. I'm a bit concerned about the time. Mm. Um, the next thing before this is this certainly a change of pace. Today on our show, we did the worldwide um, launch of a of, of a song, which is a, a, a cover, a, 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 work, a reworking of an Aussie classic. I've been everywhere, called Banks Gone Everywhere. So I've given Martin the file. Take it away, Martin. <laughs> I was hunting for work on the dusty outback Aussie roads when along came a storm. That took out all the telecoms. Hey, if you're going to Cooper Pedy, mate, you better find a bank. Cause it's a desert there, you know, unless you got cash stuffed in your tank. What's the big deal, you ask, about keeping banks in town? I say, listen, mate, I've researched every bank and they go down. We've lost every bank man, we've lost every bank man A banking desert's real man, no King O'Malley here man Travel we do our share, man, banks gone everywhere The left Tullamore, Dartmoor, Lismore, Bunbar, Theodore, Springshaw, Weewar, Marble Bar, Urbanville, Emmerville, Wallaville, Wattamrine, Cunrine, Moolamine, Duke and I, Menangatang, Franklin, Yarwin, Finch, Hatton, Dambia, Wallambilla, Wakanda, Warmer, it's a killer! We've lost every bank man, we've lost every bank man, a bank in desert's real man, no Kiwi bank here man, trouble we have our fears man, banks gone everywhere! For that Kiki, Tali, Druidry, Dinadu, Caniva, Kambalda, Kandanga, Kalangadu, Dalvin, Tambourine, Baradine, Whitnoon, Jericho, Threadbow, Reno, Nanagoon, Branson, Thalon, Kurubon, Mandala, Quandiella, Baladana, Tanagala, Profits Matter. We've lost every bank man, revolution in the air man, councils in despair man, bankocracy takes our cash, we need a fair income bank man, banks gone everywhere. What about cash? Rolson, Herbden, Galagamon, Gabanji, Claremont, Mylon, Grong, Grong, Murrundi, Yungabara, Mikathola, Warringara, Cumbia, Bogabri, Bermaguri, Bajiwai, Karumba, Gordon Vale, Green Vale, Miraval, Kapala, Walla Walla, Mida, Mida, Milla, Milla, where's Bob Catter? Where was every bank man? Revolution in the air man. Statesmen are too rare man. Bankruptcy takes out cash. We need a fan, we can bank, bank. Banks gone everywhere. ATMs? Been along, Gulagon, Woodenbong, Feral Flat, Coldborough, Old Mara, Bundara, Kapasat, Kalani, Buyutara, Kari, Kari, Penguin, Terrigal, Fingu, Jabu, Jung, Wangi, Wangi, Nimbin, Omeo, Dori, Dori, Bangalore, Durham, Bangi, Kulgadi, Jandari, Wandari, it's the economy! Fight for a post of bank man, fair to people's bank man, banksters have no clothes man, we'll force the banks to compete, advance Australia fair man, post banks everywhere. What about cancels? Livingston, Mornington, Darren, Wagga Wagga, Cooper, Pity, Derwent Valley, Edward River, Bellina, Cobar, Barunga West, Tamora, Banana, Flinders, Yilgarn, Narrabri, Upper Hunter, Strathfield, Cumberland, La Trobe, Etheridge, Barclay. Let's legislate. Fight for a post office bank man, a fair income 
people's bank men. Banksters have no clothes and will force the banks to compete. Advance Australia firm and post banks everywhere. Post banks everywhere. We'll go here, there, everywhere with the post bank everywhere. Post bank everywhere. Post bank everywhere. Yeah, well, that's uh, quite a work, and boy, does it get to the heart of the matter, uh, Robbie. Well, that's Australia right now, and um, <laughs> so credit credit for that goes to uh, Jan Pakalis in Queensland. That was she. That was all her work. She um, came up with that idea, and she she wrote the song and uh, etc. She made the point when she first told us about it that half those names are in the original. <laughs> So, so, so that original "I've Been Everywhere" song, all those banks are gone, um, uh, and and just to credit her husband Dennis, provide the backing vocals there. The data, of course, Martin came from our friend Dale Webster. Um, that's that's you know because Dale is the one who does all the work on this, right? So, yep. uh, that's 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 Australia for you uh, in 2024. And if we if this show tonight was about banks closing branches, you know, we'd go for hours, but. Um, it's not about that. Let's get on to the RBA, I think. <laughs> well, um, yeah, right. I mean, it, actually, it's interesting because a lot of yeah. the issues ultimately are sheeted back at what the RBA has done and is doing. 100%. 100%. 100%. We, have a, we have a banking system that the RBA is supposed to be in charge of. Um, it has the powers to be in charge of it. And... Uh, it, those powers were designed to actually give the RBA a constraining role over the banks. I strongly argue now that all we've seen from the RBA um, for a long time now is a facilitator of the worst behaviour of the banks. Now, a couple of things we can single out. One of them is is um, uh, the problem with with mortgages. So, but let's just let's talk about that second because I just just to pre, just to give you a thing we wrote about this week which I, I think is another example. And that's the question of cash as well. And for, the RBA is issues Australia's cash. And we we accuse them this week, Martin, of being effectively turning themselves into a PR agency for the banks because what the RBA has done a lot in the last few months is put out studies and make comments related to cash that lead to screaming headlines, Australia's going cashless, right? And- when you actually drill into what they're saying, it is not. It is so superficial and shallow. It's not funny. Now we've talked about a bunch of those in the show. So the first one that I cited four examples. The first one was um, uh, uh, in, on the twenty seventh of November. They they did a paper. No, they sorry. They released the results of a survey. Remember we talked about the survey. Fewer than a thousand people in their sample, and we contrasted it to your survey, Martin, which is. A thousand people a week, right? Fifty thousand in a year. So the Martin North DFA survey has actually an, a rolling sample that adds up, accumulates to fifty thousand people. The RBA survey is based on fewer than a thousand, and they they do it every three years, and they claim that um, cash as a share of transactions has plunged to thirteen percent from sixty nine percent in two thousand and seven. And we pointed out some things. One, they provide percentages, but they never provide the absolute numbers that they're percentages of. Because if they did that, the real story there is, is actually the number of transactions has exploded. So the ABA has these figures, the Banking Association, that, that, that record transactions running at about $200 million a month in 2007. That's now $1.2 billion a month, right? And, and population growth, all sorts of things, but young people waving phones for everything, Right. You know, and there's a. I saw this one thing. There's a, this one article saying that there's a. Um, when you tap with your phone, you, you, it, it triggers the pleasure impulse of your brain. But when you pay with cash, it, it actually triggers the the pain impulse. Right. That's why cash is really good for saving. Um, uh, you know, people think about it when they when they're spending cash, right? Whether it's, when it's just when it's just your credit card or your phone or what, your debit card and your phone or whatever, it's it's easier not to think about it. Anyway, so but this is a, this is really shallow reporting by the banking the, by the Reserve Bank. So that was that was the end of November. Um, uh, then in mid uh, December, Michelle Bullock g- gave a speech about the payment system, and she talked about 
cash. And she was asked a question about whether there should be a surcharge on cash transactions. Now, she didn't say there shouldn't be. What she said was it would be politically, she acknowledged it would be politically hard. There would be, there would be massive backlash to putting on a surcharge. But she accepted the premise of the question, which is that the small business people who like using cash, they don't carry the cost of the, the, the logistics of cash. There is, you know, moving cash around, there is a cost. And she complained, Michelle Bullock complained, small businesses don't carry that cost. It's carried by the financial institutions, i.e. the banks. And I said, well, that's their business. The bakery carries the cost of buying flour, paying electricity for the for the, the heat in the ovens, all that sort of stuff. That's his business. The bank's business is money. Why should we be upset that they're carrying the cost of their business, right? And and she actually, if if she could, she might she might you know encourage a surcharge on cash transactions. And what that does, of course, is tips the, puts the thumb on the scale in favour of the banks, you know, away from small businesses. So that was that was the RBA in December. And then the latest one is the, um, and I don't know if you saw this one, Martin. You may have some comments about it too, because it, it related to it reminded me of the um the, the KPMG report on on um the ten thousand dollar cash ban. But so the the Reserve Bank Borden had a paper in there about cash, and in one sense they acknowledged that cash demand was at an all time high because there's there's an all time high um, v- volume of cash in circulation, Australian Australian currency in circulation over hundred billion dollars, and then they basically said the majority of that is either hoarding or organised crime, and the problem with them saying that is it's cash. They actually don't know how to trace it. They don't know what it is. It is a black hole. There was a hearing um, in the bank closures. Um, uh, inquiry in, uh, I think it was the hearing in in October in Parliament when the banks turned up and Senator Malcolm Roberts asked NAB about this and NAB admitted when it came to cash, they can't trace it. And of course, that drives the banks nuts. So they can't trace it. So therefore, they then model what they think is happening to this $100 billion. And they come up with these theories that it's hoarding or it's um, organized crime. And one of the pieces of evidence, and this for the theory, is the demand for cash is always for large denomination notes, not small denomination notes. So not tens, fives and tens and twenties. It's for fifties and a hundreds. That's what the RBA said. Now, hang on a cotton picking minute. (laughs) I live in this country. I'm in the economy too. Give me a break. Show me. There's no ATMs that spit out fives and tens. The banks don't want you going there to get your fives and tens. There's There are ATMs that spit out 20s, but they also give you a charge for withdrawing money. Now, I don't know if, if everyone's like me, but I know when I go to an ATM, Martin, I try and pull out 250 bucks or 300 bucks so that the $3 I get charged – doesn't feel as bad as three dollars being charged three dollars for pulling out twenty dollars, right? I mean, it's just um, so. So what? So what the RBA is actually doing here is uh, totally ignoring the reality of how this works in the real world. They use the word demand as if there's demand, uh, you know, that, 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 that there's demand for cash without the without acknowledging the other side of that, which is what the banks have done to make cash harder to source and to use and so force us into certain patterns of behaviour, right? That's not acknowledged in any of this. And so that that therefore serves their conclusion, like was the excuse for trying to ban cash transactions over $10,000 from the KPMG report in 2018. Oh, it's being hoarded or it's for organised crime. Heavens forbid. Yeah, and of course, as you say, there's no evidence of that. Um, it's just a convenient, um, um, you know, sandcastle in the air to try and explain. Actually, the fact is that people are still using cash. I'd also make the point, Robbie, and I see it in some of my surveys. Some people don't trust the banking system. 
And so they actually choose to hold some of their money out of the banking system in the form of notes, which is a perfectly legitimate and yep. legal process. So there is absolutely no problem with that. I mean, there might be a bit of risk if you get your notes burned. But the fact is, if you don't trust the banking system, then you're more likely to hold cash out of the banking system. But the banks would like – the banks are – Casting aspersions, and they're assisted by the RBA, casting aspersions on people who are doing that perfectly legal activity. Yep. Right? And and to so much so that there is now, there has been, in the last 12 months, there were two pieces of commentary I saw. One from a young lady who tried to do, there's a, a TikTok trend of spending cash for everything to save money. Mm. And she admitted, she was a young ABC journal, she admitted it worked. But she said, I felt like a criminal lining up to spend to pay $20 for a for a coffee. Like like buying a coffee. She if she paid $20 for a coffee, she, she would be a criminal. Or someone would be a criminal in that transaction. No, no. So pulling out $20 in cash to pay for a coffee, she said she felt like a criminal. That's how the culture has shifted here. And then um an older person actually, uh so sort of in, in a different article in some magazine or whatever made a, a, uh, a similar reflection. And this is actually something the banks and the, the, the system has tried to engender, a sense of, of um, there's something untoward about using cash. No, there is not. Anyway, so this is the RBA though. Why is the RBA, whose job is to make sure that the banks behave, it should be, why is the RBA doing this kind of stuff for the banks? And... So then let's go back to mortgages because we now have a situation, Martin, where um, I saw your tweet today about the, the, the statistics are effectively unprecedented for yep. mortgage stress, mortgage stress and, and rental stress um, rental stress in Australia. And I noticed, and you got the, um, uh, the household debt to income uh, as well, right, which is up there in the stratosphere. And that's all – exploded if you look at the actual chart that you produced look at the growth you know the growth is since 2000 right this was 2000 i mean that that's my memory of it 2000 is when property prices started um growing in australia and the whole thing was facilitated by the rba and it was facilitated by the rba lowering interest you know the, the, the politicians did some things as well peter costello introduced a 50% discount for the capital gains tax. Um, so suddenly housing investment became a, a very um, profitable. And John Howard introduced the first home buyers uh, grant around in 2001. Um, but before that, the CPI had changed and they took out a key component. I, I saw you interviewing, you know, your discussion with Leith and Onslin that covered some of this, right? They don't count a key component of housing cost in CPI. And so that allowed the RBA to lo keep lowering interest rates from 2000 onwards, they fluctuated a bit, but in general, the, the impetus was to lower them. Um, and the more property prices went up, the more they lowered them. Um, and, and when the property prices started to wobble, right, because they, be they started to become unaffordable, the RBA turns around and lowers them even more. So there was a few spikes around, around the financial crisis, et cetera. Um, but in general, they did their bit so, so now we've got property prices that are completely disconnected from the ability of Australians to pay for them. There is there is no functional relationship in that at all, right? There should be a relationship between our ability to, to save from our incomes and and buy a house, and that's why the historical, you know, um, uh, ratio is something like you know three to four to one um, in terms of housing household cost to income annual income. Um, that's all broken in Australia, right? Um, and the RBA helped to make that happen. And so now we've got a situation where you got the, you know, arguably the most expensive housing in the world. You've got a huge amount of mortgage debt out there that is having a direct and indirect impact on Australian households, direct on the on the households that are mortgages indirect on the households that are renting, and then certainly knock-on effects from that as well, right? A huge amount. Um, and then 
the RBA pulled out all stops when COVID came along and slashed interest rates down to 0.1%, right? And then drove them the biggest spike in house prices that we've ever seen. Um, and, you know, just six months after the Treasurer had said, Michael, or the Assistant Treasurer Michael Sook had said, go out and buy, borrow and buy. Um, and now inflation happens, inflation breaks out because of what the RBA has been doing, like other central banks around the world. And what does the RBA do? They turn around and these people who are in this debt did not cause this problem, but they turn around and absolutely smash them with the fastest interest rate rises in history, right? Zero point From 0.1% to 4.5% in terms of the RBA cash rate in 13, I think it was 13 interest rate decisions spread over two years. And at one stage there, it was running at 12, uh, I think it was, 12 decisions, there were 12 interest rate rises in 13 months, and then they had took a break in and they did did another one. Was it last November or something like that? Um, and Australian households have have are in the pain that you can see. I mean, I have to tell you, you know, we've got this cost of living crisis. But um, so, Martin, I think you you did the you did the work. I think you should explain the figures because I I had a just to tell, for the audience, I had a discussion with Martin. I said. We keep hearing about the cost of living. It seems to me that the biggest factor, the biggest single impost in the cost of, of what Australian households are going through now has to be what they're paying because of these interest rate rises. Um, and so you did the aggregate figures, Martin, for all households in Australia. What is that up to? Yeah, and just on the way into that, uh, let me just explain. There, there are two big factors at work here, right? The first factor relates to money that the banks hold centrally at the RBA on, on which they get interest paid, right? And, of course, the term funding facility was a massive amount of money that the RBA handed over at very cheap rates to the banks. The banks then put that into their um, exchange equalization accounts at the RBA, and they were earning up to now 4.25%. So that's created one big flow of income that the banks have enjoyed thanks to what the RBA did. I'm not going to calculate that today. We could, but that's not the point. The second is the most insidious of all, and that is that for the typical mortgage holder, as you say, interest rates dr- dramatically rose. But what that has done is created a huge amount of additional cash flow to the banks as yep. people are paying higher rates. Now, the question is, can we quantify that? And that's, in fact, the work that I've done over the last little while. So the first thing I did was to look at the trajectory of interest rates. And as you say, you know, they went up dramatically over from May 22 till the end of last year. And that's that's a very significant rise in rates. The second thing I did was to look at the total amount of loans outstanding. That's from the RBA. And, uh, you know, it's gone up quite significantly, owner-occupied and investor lending, but we know what the total debt pool is. Yep. And so by essentially taking the average interest rate, again from the RBA, on that debt, the total outstanding, what we can actually do is to calculate how much additional interest payments people are now making. So I'm not talking here about capital repayments on the mortgages. I'm just simply saying how much more are people now paying? Now, if you do on the annualized basis and you compare with where it was and where it is now, the total number is an eye-watering on an annualized basis, about 72 billion dollars 72 billion dollars additional money being sucked out of households and being given back to the banks now just to be fair there is an offset there is an offset there is an right? offset because of course deposit yeah. rates also went up and so i did the calculation also for the average amount of deposits outstanding in households the average interest rate and the offset is about 44 billion but that forty-four but, billion is not going to the same households yeah. who have all the mortgage. So there's actually yeah. a significant wealth transference, effectively, mm. through that system. But net net, the banks are still well ahead, you know, yeah, twenty-seven yeah, yeah. billion or twenty-six billion, depending on how you calculate it, right? So, so there's two observations. The first observation is there are households now paying a hell of a lot more than ever before for those mortgages. 
right? And that is one of the reasons why consumer confidence is going through the, the floor, why households are complaining about the cost of the living, et cetera, et cetera, and why mortgage stress is, is so dramatically higher than it was. Now, that's the one third of people who are in you know, mortgage land. There's a third of people who don't have any mortgages and they're probably doing okay. There's a third of people renting and we know the renters are actually also being taken to the cleaners. In fact, the latest data on rent showed that they've gone up again. The point though is that 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 44 billion, that that effectively is being paid out to people with money in the bank, right? Yeah. And those people with money in the bank are not the mortgage holders. So whilst it's okay to offset one to the other at the top level, Actually, when you pull it apart, you can see just what an impost this this has been on households. And it's all driven by bag RBA policy. Yeah. Now, so we've had this debate in Australia the last week or so about the tax cuts mm. because mm. Labor broke its promise and they've changed the tax cuts. Um, and now the Liberals today have announced that they're going to support the new version of the tax cuts because the, the lower income brackets will seemingly get more from these tax cuts. Anyway, the re- I when you and I spoke, for the benefit of the audience, I, I, I wanted Martin to, to put these in annualised aggregate figures, not, not per household, because I wanted to contrast it like this: the tax cut debate is being couched in the context of the cost of living, right? And the government is going to – they're going to help alleviate the cost of living. But the, the value, the total value that the government is putting back in the pockets of taxpayers, supposedly with these tax cuts, is about twenty billion dollars in a year, and that'll, that'll apparently climb to in, into the thirties somewhere down the track. But twenty billion that is for alleviation of the cost of living, in contrast to seventy billion dollars coming out of households in twenty twenty four. That wasn't coming out of households in the beginning of 2022. Seventy billion dollars. There's no comparison. This is the nub of the issue with cost of living. Yep. Now it's already shown the the inflation figures already show the CPI already shows that 50 percent of CPI is housing cost, right? So that should be known to the politicians. But they're having these massive fights about the nature of the tax cuts. And nobody wants to touch this issue, or nobody did, seemingly, Martin, until today. Yeah. Because yeah. suddenly, these three Labor premiers, Roger Cook in WA, Jacinta Allen here in Victoria, and Stephen Miles, I think, started it in the, Queens- the Queensland Premier, they have come out calling for the RBA, because the inflation figure is lower, to drastically reduce interest rates um, as fast as they raise them. Now, (laughs) it just so happens, I called for this, the Citizens Party, I wrote it, but the Citizens Party called for this two weeks ago. But what we called for was very, very specific because what we're we're trying to get people to understand what the nature of this bill that Jim Chalmers is trying to pass, the RBA reforms bill that we have to stop because in the, the the first item of the bill, the first provision of the bill, is to remove his power as treasurer to overrule the Reserve Bank on monetary policy, i.e. interest rate decisions. This is a power the treasurer has had for 72 years, and Jim Chalmers is has a bill where he's proposing to give it away. Now, we should put up um, on the screen, you can, when you can, the Senator Nick McKim, the Green Senator, came out today um, about this because his point was, and when I saw the State Premier's mark, my point was, hang on, go after the RBA as much as you like, but your Labor Premiers, and you, Stephen Miles especially, you're a Queensland Labor Premier, you have a man in your state, your own party colleague, Jim Chalmers, who has the power right now to order the RBA to lower interest rates. The difference between what they've called for and what we called for is we took to, to, we took issue with a lie that Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock said last year in Senate Estimates because she said, we, the RBA, only have one tool to deal with inflation, which is interest rates. 
No, they do not. And that's in this that's that's almost acknowledged in this legis- Chalmers legislation as well, because his second provision is to is to repeal the power the RBA has to direct the lending policy of banks. And that's in section 36 of the Banking Act. The RBA can tell the banks, you will um, stop lending. This is an in- for, uh, for instance, right? Stop lending money to mortgage, to property investors. Just stop it or reduce it to 10% of what you've been doing or something like that. Last time you and I talked, Martin, we talked about the fact that investor lending was far and away leading the growth in mortgage lending in Australia, lending to investors, the thing that drove up property prices more than anything, right? Took it out of the hand. This is what made it unaffordable for the homeowners, the genuine homeowners, and especially the first home buyers, because they're competing with these investors that are that are, you know, geared to their eyeballs, right? Le- leverage to the hilt. Um, and the banks were throwing money at them and to, to keep driving these property prices up. So the RBA has the power to say to the banks, stop doing that. So the RBA could cut interest rates to the, tomorrow and provide instant relief. Just say they cut interest rates by two percentage points, something like that, right? They could provide instant relief to millions of families across Australia, but not fuel another round of speculation because they could actually constrain it with this other policy they have to tell the banks what to do. Yet those are the first two provisions in the legislation that Jim Chalmers is trying to repeal so that he can prove after the fact that she's telling the truth because he takes away the power, he takes away the other tools that they have. This is this is unconscionable. Australians shouldn't stand for this. So we but we actually believe this this uh, we are advocating strongly. Yes, if you want to understand the cost of living, that seventy billion dollars coming out of households in Australia explains it, right? And something has to be done about that, and it can be done. But we have to stop Jim Chalmers passing this bill. We have to stop him. We has to we, we have to make sure he doesn't remove the powers. He has to use the powers. And now we've got these three state premiers carrying on on this issue. They must be, the public must demand that they tell their own colleague, stop passing that bill, use these powers. The debate has really, I mean, the battle's joined. The debate's really erupted. Yeah, and two observations. The first is that, of course, the RBA still has a very neoliberal philosophy that says, let the market be the market. We don't want to intervene, you know. So we've only got one lever, which is interest rates, right? When in fact, as you say, they've got a bunch of other levers and they can direct and uh, shape the way that lending is done. And if you go back a couple of decades before this neoliberal philosophy really came over the top, they were doing that. The central banks were actually much, much more aware of not letting housing prices run away and not let lending standards dilute, et cetera, et cetera, financial stability risks and all that, right? The second observation is that, of course, APRA is concerned about financial stability risks. And conveniently, they're not saying, we're not seeing any real you know, concern. But they recently came out and said, oh, but there's a bit of a, of, of a, tip, a tick up in terms of delinquencies and defaults. And we know that the banks are bending over backwards to try and actually not lift the default rates by extending mortgages out for a longer period of time, which, of course, gives the banks even more access to greater profits because it means that people are paying higher interest rates, but for a lot longer period. So the way that policies are actually shaping at the moment, it's all about households paying through the nose for longer. And so we've got to question the fundamental philosophical basis on which this economy is running at the moment, because it is clearly not in the interests of ordinary Australians. It's in the interest of the banks because they are making ever more profits. It's in in the interest possibly of some politicians who happen to have many investment properties and so are benefiting from negative gearing and all the other benefits that are there. And the other interesting observation, if you stand back and look at the cost of negative gearing, the cost of Commonwealth mm. rent assistance, et cetera, et cetera, those numbers, again, are huge. So, in fact, 
what's happening at the moment is there's a huge amount of money being thrown into the housing system, again, taxpayers' money, but it's actually going in the wrong direction. And so the net net result is higher house prices, more people not being able to buy properties and these high interest rates. So we have to break the nexus here. And as you say, the treasurer has the power, but he's trying to wash his hands of it and saying, oh, we don't want to use that power. Well, if, you know, this legislation must not pass, but more importantly, Chalmers must do something very important to recognize that we can't let this neoliberal philosophy just continue into the future. Well, Martin, I think you captured uh, the real story there when you mentioned financial stability because we've just made our submission today, the Citizens Party's submission to the um, Senate inquiry into the RBA reforms bill, and it was written by Elisa Barwick. Um, now, Elisa uh, used the submission to actually address the most curious thing about this whole saga, which was that these, 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 this bill is implementing reforms recommended by the RBA review, of which there were 50 recommendations. The priority recommendation, the first recommendation out of 50, was to remove this treasurer's overall power over the RBA. But the curious thing was it's a 72-year power that's existed. It's never been used. It was not in the terms of reference. It was not in a, a discussion point in the actual RBA review. How did this become recommendation number one, given that? And what Elisa has shown is that this is all about this fundamental issue of the central banks and regulators holding up financial stability as the objective of policy over, elevate that over the welfare of the people. So in other words, the policy to regulate the banking and financial system is to ensure the system serves itself, keeps stable in, in and of itself, rather than making sure it serves the people, so much so that the RBA has, an, has objectives in its legislation. And one of those objectives is full employment um, uh, uh, in uh, you know, keeping inflation in check and the the uh, the the welfare and the the prosperity of the people of Australia, and this legislation will also bump down the the objective of of the welfare and prosperity of the people of Australia below the RBA's objective to um, full employment uh, to to inflation to to controlling inflation, right? Um, because that is no longer a factor and it's all justified in the name of financial stability. And in fact, this fundamentally, and we prove it in our submission, and we're going to publish the, you know, I'm sure the, the Senate inquiry will publish our submission, but we will publish our submission separately on our website and people can look for this um, because we go through a timeline there. This relates to bail-in. Financial stability is a, is a concept that first reared its ugly head in relation to this debate about bail-in, and it's, it's exactly the same issue. And we go through the timeline, starting with the directives for bail-in from the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements and the Financial Stability Board post the GFC, where at every stage they would say, we need these extraordinary powers to make sure the system can survive another crash, but at every stage the authorities such as the BIS or the IMF would say, we have to make sure the government cannot, if there's a situation where these powers are being used, we must ensure they are entirely independent of government so the government cannot interfere with their exercise. Why? Because they're talking about scenarios where the powers will be used to crush people to save the system and only heartless, callous, bastard, apparatchik bureaucrats will be, will be willing to do that even the worst bastard politician will be thinking, I don't if I, well, I don't I don't want my constituents to have their savings in the bank bailed in. They're not going to vote for me at the next election. And so from this, this was this is writ large 
through this whole last 15-year battle, and our party's been in the middle of that, and, and that's essentially, that's effectively how you and I got to know each other, Martin, on the bail-in, bail-in issue, right? Yep. Um, where where the, 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 um, the system, the, 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 the high priests of the, of the temple of central banks, et cetera, said, no, no, we have to make sure the people wear the costs of, of um, propping up the system, don't reform the system, come up with things like bail-in, et cetera, make sure the people wear the cost of it. We have to change this system, the, the, the part of the system where the governments have any kind of oversight role. That must go. And this became a consistent theme. And then we use the example, and it's really transparent in New Zealand, where there's been this series of, of both bail-in reforms and Reserve Bank New Zealand reforms. And Reserve Bank New Zealand is like a neoliberal um, uh you know, um, model for the world in many ways. Um, there's some there's some quirky exceptions too. They've said some interesting things about cash, but but in terms of monetary policy and whatever, um, and and it's and it's quite transparent. Then we give those examples to show that, in, and in the context of the timeline, you actually see, oh, this is why out of the blue, this has become the number one priority recommendation. Our treasurer is bowing the knee and handing up his power like a like a, a medieval knight surrendering his sword to a conqueror to the Bank for International Settlements, the IMF, and the Financial Stability Board. That's what he's doing. That international apparatus will have the say over us, not any we will not have any sovereign democratic say over ourselves anymore if this bill is passed. Yes, and just to remind you that those um BIS um, uh, you know, IMF, they are unelected, right? Technocrats who know what's best for the world, right? You know, well, one they, of the, one of, there was a picture of one of them in that song before. The guy yeah. who said, the big fat guy said, profits matter. Augustine, yeah. the Augustine Carstens, the head president of the BIS. Yeah, no, I- exactly right. And uh, of course, they are um, connected quite strongly into the, you know, Davos and all of those things. So, so there's this international, you know, groupthink from those powerful people and from those unelected representatives dictating policy down through central bank land and also through political land too, because, of course, quite often what you find is that some of the thought bubbles that are coming out of those centralised organisations find their way in to the legislative processes within countries, for example, yep. via the Treasury and, and via other, other people too. So... This is actually a question ultimately about democracy mm. and it's about power and who wields power and to what end, right? And, and so it becomes a question of what sort of country do we want and who is actually going to be accountable for what happens within our country. And politicians are washing their hands and saying, nothing to do with us. We'll just hand a little bit more power across those unelected international representatives. That's nuts. Well, this issue was actually addressed, examined, and settled in 1937 by the Banking Royal Commission then. They looked at this very issue, and they ruled that the parliament of the day must be the ultimate authority over the financial system, and the exe- and the ex- um, and the government is the executive of the parliament. That's a, virtually a a word-for-word quote from the, the 1937 Royal Commission report, and that's when they recommended recommended what became Section 11, this power that's going to be removed. They said there should be a the um, the RBA should the, the bank should do what it does, but if there's any conflict, there should be a some kind of a, a resolution process negotiate between the bank and the government. But at the end of the day, the the bank must implement the will of the government, and so the the, the ruling was. The elected government must have the ultimate authority over the unelected bank. That was in 1937. John Curtin, that year, September 1937, the Fremantle Town Hall, when he launched the Labor Party's um, federal election campaign that year, he said that Labor demanded the recommendations of the Royal Commission be implemented. And he said, if the government of the day excludes itself from the making of monetary policy, it cannot govern except in a secondary degree. That's an exact quote. It cannot government accept in a secondary degree. In other words, somebody else is in charge and it's not democracy. But thanks to Providence, he was pres- prime minister in 1945 um, after he saved us in World War II and Ben Chifley was his treasurer and they enacted this power 
in the Banking Act in 1945, and we've had it ever since. Now, one of the stupid arguments these apparatchiks, these technocrats come up with, Martin, is that the power of a banking um, is so great that elected politicians would be irresponsible with it. <laughs> but hang on, if we've had this, if we've had this overall power for 72 years, and it has never been used in 72 years, it's been discussed a few times, but it's never been used. That actually showed that there's a really good example there. Forget these glib little um, uh, excuses and justifications like that one that you hear. Oh yeah, politi- you know, politician, populist politicians are irresponsible. There's an actual real life example of Australian politicians who every generation ha- have, has considered their politicians deadbeats, right? They've never used this power. They've never, so by definition, they've never abused it. I would argue they've failed in their duty because they should have used it. And in fact, the way they should have used it is not to lower interest rates, or maybe in the 80s they should have lowered interest rates, but they should have, they, the treasurer of the day in the, um, Josh Frydenberg in COVID, and I think it was Joe Hockey in uh, 2013, 2014, when interest rates were really being pushed down really low to ridiculous levels, they should have used it the other way. They should have intervened to say to the RBA, no, you will not lower interest rates that much. We will do something differently, right? This the, this power cuts both ways. They should have done that anyway. So no, and and they so they've never used it. So therefore, by definition, it's never been used irresponsibly. All those sort of arguments are rubbish. It, it is fundamentally about democracy. That's what the John Curtin quote is all about, right? And so if you want to if you want to live in a system where Unelected technocrats that you have no say over have total say over your life because what's the great John Maynard, I mean, Keynes quote where he talked about how, you know, I think he, I think he referred to philosophers. You, you're a philosopher. You know better than me. But like he talked about how the average working class man dismisses philosophers but doesn't know that their whole life is defined by the ideas of philosophers going back hundreds of years, right? Well, just as surely as that's true, it is even more true that the, the the parameters of our existence now in the financial it all comes down to the economy, right? Bill Clinton won in 1992 on this slogan, it's the economy stupid, and he was right. It always comes down to that. The parameters are defined by the decisions of these central banks, right? That's what's that's what shaped the system. And if you're happy living in a system where you have no say over that, even indirectly through the democratic process, well, ignore what we're talking about. But if you're not happy, Right, and you understand the principle of uh, that this, there must be ultimate people's authority over the system. We have to stop this bill. So that's what that's what um, you know this discussion's about. The good news is we've got the premiers in revolt um, and in rebellion. <laughs> so <laughs> the revolting premiers are in rebellion. So it, it, that that shows you, you know, that's the people calling them populists today. In fact, the Australian newspaper, which is you know like. The Australian is Murdoch. They, they're just that Murdoch actually was part. I don't have time to go through this. Murdoch was part of the neoliberal project of Australia from the get go. He actually funded a lot of the think tanks to turn us into this mess. Outside of the role his newspapers played, played, but what they played it today because they accused these premiers of bullying the RBA. The three premiers are bullying the RBA by calling for interest rates to be cut. Right? Yeah, you know, what a joke. Um, uh, so that, so that, but the but the premiers got their ear to the ground, right? They know what your your you know the Martin North DFA chart shows you. They know that this is really really tough out there, and what we're saying is there's a non-populist but democratic and practical way to address this, and it does require using these powers. So the this today is Friday. The the def, the submissions to the inquiry closed today, so you can't make a submission anymore. But this inquiry will run until about mid March. And what we're now encouraging people to do, take up this issue with your member of parliament and your senators, write to them, email them, visit them, call them, and just say, you must not pass this bill. You must not give up the democratic authority over the bank. You must not do that. And just keep hammering on it so that the first thing we achieve is eventually that most members of parliament do know about it, unlike bail-in. Right, but we've got to hammer them until they they're aware. Well, hang on, this is actually an issue, and then then become aware that why are we giving up this power? Right, that's an extraordinary thing for a politician to be willing to give up. So that's that's something you can do practically to to make a difference on this issue right now. 
Absolutely. And uh, as you say, the um, submissions are closing now, but there's still a good opportunity. I'll also make the final point here, uh, Robbie, that uh, if you think of things like central bank digital currencies, social scores, um, you know, a lot of other things that people are talking about. Well, a lot of those are being advocated again by those central bankers because they have this dystopian future where everything is digital, everything is controlled, everything is monitored. And, you know, I don't want to um, you know, go over the top here, but it gets more and more and more, not 1984 all over again, right? Um, that is the vision benign, that they've got. They, they think it'll be a benign 1984 because yeah. they're in charge. Well, exactly. And guess what? The people in charge, <laughs> the people in charge, of course, are always the people who are um, doing it. What's in best for us? Well, actually, there's an alternative path. And this is a way of making sure that that alternative path um, where democracy rules and accountability is held amongst those that are elected, not the unaccountable. And that is the fundamental reason why this is so important. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered it all, Martin. We'd better leave it there. It's getting, the sun's gone down here. <laughs> Robbie, thank you very much, as always. Um, I'm sure we'll revisit this over the next uh, few weeks as things um, progress. But again, let's look underscore- out for our submission. I, I encourage everyone to look out for our submission on our website. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm assuming, Martin, you'll put up your chart um, yep. because I saw that on Twitter today. Yes. People need to see this yep. chart in detail. Um, and yeah, how many your politicians? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is this, democracy happens when people take an interest and react. And we've shown that actually people taking an interest and reacting and making sure that their politicians know what you think makes a hell of a difference. So this is a great opportunity, yep. once again, to exercise your democratic right and make sure your politician knows about it. Yep, exactly. Robbie, thanks very much. Look forward to the next one. See you soon. Take care. Thanks, Martin. See you.